Welcome, Ben Mama. When examining the sales of various video game consoles and computers, there are three clear categories we can place them all into. Worldwide success stories like the Sega Mega Drive, Atari 2600 or Commodore 64, regional success stories like the NEC PC Engine, Sinclair ZX Spectrum and ColecoVision, then outright failures that were either rejected across multiple regions like the Atari Jaguar, Nokia N-Gage and Sword M5, or never really made it out of their homeland due to their sluggish sales, like the Casio PV1000, Computers Links, or Epoch Super Cassette Vision. But within that last category, there is a kind of grey area. Consoles and computers that are rightly regarded as failures when you look at worldwide sales, but somehow manage to make a mark in one specific region or country. Freakish occurrences that will seem incredibly strange to anyone that didn't experience them firsthand. And that's what I'm going to be looking at in this video. Five different consoles and computers that somehow managed to grab a small slice of success somewhere after failing everywhere else. There are a multitude of different reasons for all of these which I'm hoping will provide you, my loyal viewers, with some interesting stories to ponder over. So without further ado, let's look at the strange regional success stories of five failed systems. Looking for a TV game? These games are good, but we don't think they're as good as the Dick Smith Wizard. Wow, look at the fantastic picture! With a picture made of 49,000 dots, thousands and thousands more than the other game. The Wizard tennis game is the greatest! The Wizard has real Space Age controllers, not just simple sticks, and special game overlays that show you how to play. Unreal! Auto chase and air sea attack! Sonic Invader, tank attack and planet defender! The most brilliant feature, a cartridge converting your wizard to a personal computer with the same microprocessor as the Apple computer. And the cost of the wizard, only $295. That's 200 under comparable units. The Dick Smith Wizard! Exclusive to Dick Smith Electronics. In 1981, Hong Kong-based electronic games and toy manufacturing giants VTEC attempted to join the rising home video game market by engineering an original system capable of competing against the popular Atari 2600 VCS and Mattel Intellivision. Using a 2 MHz 6502 CPU, the same video chip as the MSX, and a sound chip that was later found in the Sega Master System, it had impressive specs for the time. In fact, aside from the CPU, it was remarkably similar to the rival ColecoVision that came out around the same time. So much so, in fact, that VTEC later released the converter to be able to play Coleco games on their console. If you want to know more about that story, I've done another video on the subject, so just follow the link in the description or top right hand corner of the screen for more. In another similar move to Coleco in their Atom, a computer version of the Creative Vision was also released, called the VTEC Laser 2001, as well as a kit to turn your Creative Vision into a fully fledged computer. It was finally discontinued in 1986 with a tiny library of just 17 games, though there have been some great homebrews released in more recent years that do add to this. I think this meagre selection of cartridges tells you everything you need to know about the success of the system, or lack thereof. VTEC did release the system worldwide, with regional distribution being picked up by various different companies, including Funvision in Germany, Educat in Israel, Solora in Finland, and famous washing machine manufacturer Zanussi in Italy, where it did at least receive some decent distribution. But the real success story came from down under, with Australian consumer electronics chain Dick Smith licensing the rights to the console and renaming it The Wizard. Due to the amusingly named Dick Smith dominating the electronics retail sector across both Australia and New Zealand, the console sold in pretty decent numbers across this part of the world, and still has quite a large following in these countries too. Although Dick Smith did rebrand all of VTEC's existing games, 
They never actually created any of their own, as you might have expected, despite the wizard turning over a healthy profit for the company. The cursed Commodore 116 range was created purely out of fear. Jack Trammell was worried about the emergence of low-cost home computers like the ZX Spectrum and Mattel Aquarius on the market and had further concerns that the Japanese were ready to do the same thing with their MSX range. His fears were well-founded too, as the Japanese were already dominating the home electronics sector with their lower price offerings and had pushed many American companies out of business in the process. So why would the computer market be any different? The Commodore 116 would replace the VIC-20 as the company's base model offering and was significantly cheaper to manufacture. It would feature a massively cost-reduced chipset all based around the multi-purpose TED chip and featured a rubber chiclet style keyboard, not unlike the Spectrum and Aquarius actually. However, arguments over what these computers were going to be and how much they were going to cost would cause a lot of division within Commodore and it was ultimately one of the main reasons why Jack Trammell was pushed out of the company he founded. Whilst the 116 was released in Germany only, a much larger Commodore 16 in a black VIC-20 style case was released in both Europe and America to a rather negative reception. The hugely overpriced Plus 4 with its built-in business applications followed. But as it used a similar, reduced size keyboard as the 116, it was totally unsuitable for what Commodore intended. The only reason the Commodore 16 got any traction at all, especially in the UK, was because the company began heavily discounting them, making it a huge loss-making venture that most Commodore fans regard as the beginning of the end for the once great company. But what became of all the unsold Plus 4s? Well, rather than price dump them through electronics retailers like Dixon's and Rumbelow's, Commodore decided to sell all remaining PAL inventory to Hungary of all places. Part of the reason for this was because the PAL version of the Plus 4 was manufactured in Germany, and so it was easy to just ship them over the border. Commodore also managed to strike a deal to make the Plus 4 the standard computer for all Hungarian schools. All in all, it's thought that around 150,000 Plus 4 computers were sold through retail in Hungary by the official distributor Novo Trade, who later went on to become a video game developer, mostly due to their success with the Plus 4, and most famously created the Echo the Dolphin franchise for Sega. As well as Novo Trade's official support, a large amount of Hungarian developers also popped up to create games for the Plus 4 and it's still very well supported by homebrew games in the country to this very day, including many unofficial conversions of all-time classics from other computers. The background to what became known as the Advanced Programmable Video System is somewhat mysterious. Based on the Signetix 2650A microprocessor, the APVS series included the likes of the Astronic MPU-1000, Voltmace Database, and most importantly, the Interton VC-4000. But it's unknown who designed and released the first console in this range, or even who created the basic hardware design that all the consoles are based on. It's even been speculated that the design could have actually come from electronics giants Philips themselves, who own Signetix, as an early design of what became the Video Pack and Odyssey 2, which ultimately included an Intel 8048 instead. Most believe that the first model is the 1292 Advanced Programmable Video System, which was released by obscure European electronics company Audiosonic in 1978. But as I mentioned, this is just a small part of a huge family of consoles that are all based on the same technology, as the image on the screen right now shows. All these consoles used the same design, which included that quirky 8-bit Signetix 2650 AI CPU at 4.43 MHz and a rudimentary graphics chip capable of displaying 8 colours, 4 sprites and simple playfield graphics. They all played the same games, but didn't actually use the same cartridges, as due to differences in the individual designs changing the size of the cartridge slot, which led to even more confusion about the range. But let's go back to the aforementioned Interton VC4000, which is undoubtedly the best known and most widely distributed version of the console, mainly due to its huge success in Germany. This version of the APVS 
was designed and manufactured by the already successful German hearing aid company Interton Electronics. It wasn't their first entry into the video game market either, having previously produced the reasonably popular Interton Video 3001, a plug and play Pong clone. Interton's version of the APVS hardware came in a very slick looking black case with two hardwired controllers that both feature a 12 button keypad, two fire buttons and an analog stick. Inside the system's control panel there are four different buttons, an on off switch, reset, select and start. It had an RF port to connect it to a standard colour TV and was sold for a very reasonable 298 Deutschmarks which equates to just under €400 Euros in today's money or around £340 slash $430. With at least 20 different manufacturers producing their own variations of the console, it's impossible to say how many units it sold in total, and as Interton never released any official sales figures, it's hard to even nail that down to one specific region. But with around 60 different games being produced for the VC4000 during its lifetime and working examples of Interton's console being extremely easy to find on the German version of eBay, not to mention anecdotal stories from people who owned them back in the day, leads us to believe that it was a fairly successful console in this region, despite never really making any kind of impact elsewhere, mainly due to the huge success of the Atari 2600, which was released a year before. Anyone who's even aware of Tangerine's Oric 1 computer will know that it was created as one of the earliest rivals to the widely successful Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And if you don't know about the Oric, then may I suggest watching my comprehensive Amazing Facts video on the 8-bit computer. The Oric 1 hit the UK market on 1st of September 1982 and looked suspiciously like the computer it was trying to compete with. The speed at which Tangerine got the Oric 1 to market very much helped it capitalise on some of the early supply shortages that Sinclair was suffering, and it saw some early success. They also undercut the price of the Spectrum slightly to make it seem even more attractive too, with the 16K version costing around £125 and the full fat 48K coming in at around £165, but these high sales soon petered out when Sinclair got their supply chain in full swing. As well as getting a good start in the UK home computer market with sales of approximately 160,000 units throughout 1983, Tangerine also launched the Oric 1 in France to a very positive reception too, selling just over 50,000 units there in a matter of months in the same year. This actually made it the best selling home computer in France at the time, and saw several new software houses popping up to support it, including famous names like Laura Seal and Infogrames who of course are still going today and are the current owners of the Atari brand. These strong sales in France continued into the following year and based on the hugely popular reception from our Gallic cousins, Tangerine Computers managed to secure a crop of new investors and launched the Oric brand across the rest of Europe, but this was met with limited success sadly, meaning France very much remains the Oric Computers greatest love story. Released to much fanfare in 1993, the 3DO alongside the Atari Jaguar and Commodore Amiga CD32 very much ushered in the 32-bit generation and showed a lot of early promise before ultimately being pushed out the market by the Sega Saturn and even more so the Sony PlayStation. The 3DO company was most prominently headed up by XEA boss Trip Hawkins, but the team of engineers and programmers responsible for creating the hardware and its early games had mostly come from Epix, where they created the groundbreaking colour handheld that became the Atari Lynx, and before that many of the team were also responsible for designing the Amiga. What made the 3DO hardware itself particularly interesting however, is that it was never manufactured by the company that created it. The design was simply licensed out to a different electronics giant to build their own compatible consoles, somewhat like the Japanese MSX standard. The big problem with this was that it made the consoles very expensive, as a large chunk of the cost had to go back to 3DO themselves in licensing fees and royalties. 
This meant that the companies who manufactured the format like Panasonic, Sanyo and Gold Star couldn't adopt the razor blade model of their console rivals, where the hardware would often be sold at a loss or with an extremely small margin, knowing that they would make the money back with the purchase of expensive software. It was this extremely flawed business model with the 3DO company controlling all licensing that ultimately led to the system's downfall, as the entry price was over double some of its rivals, many of which were also more powerful too. But despite the console failing to capture any kind of significant audience in the three main gaming markets of North America, Western Europe and Japan, it did manage to gain a decent foothold in one small corner of the world, South Korea. This was solely down to the perseverance of one particular manufacturer in the form of Lucky Gold Star, now more commonly known as LG, who of course are based in the Asian country. As well as producing numerous different models of the 3DO, Gold Star also developed their own games for the format and bombarded their home audience with expensive advertising. In fact, they released more games for the 3DO in 1996, the year it was officially discontinued due to its demise in the West, than any other year. They also created a new model of the console around this time too, known as the Gold Star Alive 2 which was exclusive to South Korea and had certain resemblances in its design to the Sony PlayStation. CD로 즐기는 환상의 32-bit game, 3DO Alive. Yeah, 이거 영화의 게임이야. 긴급 습득 시켜요. 삼촌 실감 영상, 충격의 CD 음향. 이것이 멀티미디어 게임이다. 금성 3DO 온라인 단 1초도 방심할 수 없어요. And that completes my fascinating look into five failed video game systems with strange regional success stories. Are there any others you can think of that should have made the list? Or perhaps you lived in one of these countries and experienced this relative success firsthand? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments, so please get typing. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, D Vaughan, Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Ozzy B, Dos Gamer Man, Paul Daniel and Electron Star Claps. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.